Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's wait just a moment here for everybody to file into the uh, Zoom webinar room from the waiting room. I get to see the little number click for a minute or so here. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And this morning we're going to be talking about strawberries. And I have Dr. Vance Whitaker from University of Florida here to tell you all about them. He works primarily with growers, but also some homeowners. So, you know, you guys can learn how to grow them just like the growers do. I wanted to mention at the very beginning here before I forget that I have a number of links that uh, Dr. Whitaker shared with us for um, some background information, some University of Florida fact sheets on growing strawberries. So after he starts speaking, I'll go ahead and start sharing those in the chat box. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see a little box for chat and one for Q&A. So if you have a question as we're going through the presentation, feel free to type it in the Q&A box. And we're probably gonna save all of them up till the very end and go through all of them one by one. But go ahead and definitely check that chat box because I'm gonna put links up for some of the background information for growing strawberries. I'm gonna put my email address up there also. If you like a copy of the slides from Dr. Whitaker's presentation, I can email them to you if you'd like. And also we have a freestanding uh, webpage, hernandoextension.com, and I'll put a link up to it. So if you click on that, it takes you to a web page that has a full listing of all of our offices classes that are coming up. So as soon as we create a class and post it, it's gonna show up on there. So definitely bookmark that and keep checking that frequently to see what other kind of classes we have coming up. So let me go ahead, let's go ahead and get started and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Whitaker here. All right, well, thank you so much, Bill, for inviting me. Thanks for everybody that uh, has uh, participated today. I see we have more than 50 participants, so that's great. Uh, as Bill said, um, I'm a faculty member at IFAS. I'm uh, the strawberry breeder at UF, and uh, I'm located at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, which is southwest of Plant City and southeast of Tampa, kind of between the two. Um, my primary job is to develop strawberry varieties that are useful for the growers that are in the Plant City area. There's about 10,000 acres of strawberries there, a very active industry that's very demanding of uh, new varieties. And so uh, this is my first talk on uh, growing strawberries for homeowners. Uh, I'm not a horticulturalist. I was trained broadly in horticulture. I'm a plant breeder, so my talk is going to be probably a little more biased towards varieties. Uh, uh, and uh, what, I, what I'm going to do today is, let me share my screen. As I go through my presentation, and let me know if anyone can't see that presentation, um, I'm going to uh, talk for about 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. I'm going to try to be as concise as I can to leave lots of time for questions because I, I realize that this not being exactly my specialty area and being my first talk about uh, homegrown strawberries, there's probably going to be some spaces I'm going to need to fill in, and I fully expect that. So please uh, type your questions in the chat. Um, if there's one that's particularly relevant while I'm giving my presentation, I might just pause and, and go ahead and address it. Um, and, uh, but otherwise, I'll, I'll probably leave them uh, until a bit, little bit later. Um, at GCREC, uh, I conduct about four acres of strawberry breeding trials every year. So my strawberry growing experience, in a sense, is, is, is what we've learned from the past 10 years of growing these trials on the research farm. We grow them as close to commercial standards as possible. Um, obviously, what you're going to do as a homeowner is a little bit different, but a lot of the principles are the same. And, and so a lot of what I've learned about growing strawberries is from just uh, years of experience seeing a lot of pests and diseases and and issues uh, but this is a picture of some of the trials we have at GCREC one of the things I wanted to point out if you look in the top left of this picture there's a high tunnel there where we're doing a little bit of high tunnel research um, 
basically all of the strawberry production in Central Florida commercially is in open fields, uh, uh, like you see in, in front of you. Uh, there was a time when there was some, some, some protected culture work done, but really the temperature is warm enough that it's not really needed and it caused actually excessive heat in, in, in certain periods. And so um, protected culture, other than for freeze, freeze protection, like, uh, like cloth or overhead irrigation, isn't really recommended. So that's just one point that I wanted to make. Up in your area being slightly farther north, uh, you know, you might get potentially more benefit out of it. Up in the Gainesville area, I know that that's um, possibly a little bit more feasible, uh, but just a little perspective there on, on high tunnel culture. Uh, one of the things I wanna do at the outset too is just to acknowledge my team. Um, a lot of the pictures and the varieties I'm gonna show you isn't the result of just one person. So I just wanna acknowledge I work with a lot of great people uh, and this is a picture of most of them here um, uh, just after planting a couple years ago. All right, so as I said, I'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll do lots of discussion. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically talk about two main areas, how you get started in terms of preparing your soil, transplants, the varieties that you want to use, and then managing the crop. Um, things to consider regarding nutrients, diseases, pests, and, and so forth. Um, I won't really be getting into a lot of the details of hydroponic growing or anything like that. It's not an area I'm really familiar with. So just so you know, it's going to be a little more biased towards growing in the ground. And these are the links that I uh, sent Bill that he's put in the chat. Um, like he said, uh, he will also make these available on his web page and he's gonna make this PDF of this presentation available too. And so you can access, access these links directly from that if you email him later. So these are great, the, the four best resources that I can recommend to you. Um, and, and they're all on either EDIS or my page. The first three are EDIS. There's actually one on growing strawberries in the home garden that I participated in, in putting together a while back. It's a, it's a little dated, but there's still some great information there. There's a chapter on the, in the vegetable handbook for commercial growers on strawberries that has more updated variety information and has a lot of chemical information. There's a, a really handy common to strawberry diseases in Florida poster that our pathologist, Dr. Perez put together. That's really good for if you see a disease and you wanna know what it is. It's a great resource and we're gonna be looking at that later. And then we're gonna be looking at Florida strawberry varieties and that, and that bottom link is a link to my webpage where for all of our strawberry variety releases, we have videos, we have EDIS publications just for those, some basic information. So it's a good place to go if you want um, to know about strawberry varieties. All right, so just a little bit, bit of a background on the strawberry season in Florida in case you're not super familiar with it. Um, planting uh, is typically done in late September to late October in Florida. Uh, and, you know, basically commercial growers, they get their plants harvested from a nursery. I don't know if you can see my cursor. They get their plants harvested. This is a picture of a, a nursery uh, in the fall. Uh, these strawberry plants are not propagated by seed. They're a clonally propagated plant. Uh, and so they multiply by runners, these stems that run out along the ground. And most of these nurseries are in, in the ground in, in fields. And then they're dug up and sold as bare root plants, which you can see being planted here uh, in the bed. And most of the, the transplants that you're gonna receive in Florida is a bare root plant that has the leaves on, okay? Which is a little bit unusual, but the reason it's, you know, uh, if you've, if you've received dormant strawberry plants before, you might have gotten them just as the crown with the, with the leaves cut off. That's actually more common, but in Florida it's a little unusual because those leaves actually help get a little bit more early yield. Uh, and the sandy soils allow overhead irrigation to keep those leaves wet during the day for the first week after planting uh, because that water can drain in our sandy soils, allows this type of transplant to be used. So. I'm gonna make some more comments on that later about how you can sort of make adjustments, but this is the primary transplant type that's generally available. So these are planted in late September to late October. Uh, bloom begins in late October or sometime in November, and then harvest usually extends from late November 
through the middle of March at least, or as long as the, the commercial market allows. In other words, before California and Mexico are producing way too many strawberries uh, and the price plummets. Um, so this is generally for the homeowner as well, the typical time frame that you're gonna be looking at as well. Um, during the middle of the winter, we can get freezes. So freeze protection is a concern. Uh, and we're gonna have to keep that in mind as well. But this is the big picture of how the season goes. And what I would say is uh, if you're in the Spring Hill area, Hernando, Hernando County area, you're probably gonna be wanting to target about October 15th as the perfect planting date in Florida. You get a whole lot earlier than October 15th. The warm weather can really cause problems in terms of just the pests and diseases. If you, if you plant too late, you, it can get, in a cool fall can tend to get cold a little quickly and it will reduce your yield capacity. Um, but generally I wouldn't plant before October 15th, usually that October 15th to the October 25th window, uh, probably in your area is probably the ideal planting window. So that would be my recommendation. Commercial growers will often plant earlier, uh, but that's because they're trying to hit a certain market window for their fruit that's high priced. Uh, they, they, they have issues that they run into that they, they can manage as professionals, but for a homeowner, that would be really difficult, I think, uh, planting, say, at the beginning of October. I would, I would encourage you to go to the middle of the month. Uh, in terms of preparation and planting, um, you know, there, there's very specific, you know, bed dimensions in commercial production, but this picture is from the, the strawberries in the home garden eat us and basically what it recommends for home grown or gr uh, home growers also if you can to make some raised beds or maybe you can even use some uh you know some some uh, boards and you know for like a, a raised bed type of system if you've sort of built a raised a more permanent raised bed in your backyard like i have in mind for growing vegetables but some sort of raised bed and that's just because when we do get periods of rain in the fall after planting or in the spring, you really want it to drain well. Um, and so either mounding up the soil like this and covering with plastic and then planting through that, um, if you can get some black plastic or building a frame type raised bed and covering that with some kind of mulch, um, those are both good options. But if you, if you go the bed route, generally about 12 inches between two rows within the bed is generally what's recommended. And then the plants themselves within those two rows can be, I'd say 12 to 15 inches apart is, uh, depending on the variety, is a good way to go. You can plant them a little closer. Uh, 15 inch spacing is standard in commercial production, but they're pumping a lot of fertilizer to these plants, getting them probably bigger than the homeowner will. And so you could probably go with 12 inch spacing either way. And that's just a good, easy thing to remember. Just stagger the rows. So they're a little staggered in a kind of a Z or zipper kind of formation to give the maximum spacing, but about 12 inches across and 12 inch in row is a good way to go. The main thing in planting, whether you're using a bare root transplant or another type is don't plant too low. Um, if you bury the crown of the plant, uh, you're gonna get into some major disease and other types of issues. You also don't wanna plant too high either where the plant's sort of flopping around and there's some roots exposed. You wanna be very, very precise in planting right at the crown level not too high or too low. And I'd say that's, that's really the thing to keep in mind when you're planting strawberries. So transplant types, I talked about these bare root leaf on plants, but we also have plug transplants. Uh, plug transplants obviously with a, a grown in some kind of cell pack that have an active root system as opposed to a dormant system. And obviously this plug transplant, if you can get a hold of plugs, is much more easy to, to manage. You know, you, you plant them, they don't require overhead sprinkler irrigation to keep them alive like the bare root plants do. Um, and they're gonna grow a little more actively and a little faster. Downside is they're about three times more expensive than bare root plants. But generally for a homeowner, I'm gonna recommend you go with plug transplants, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience or it's not easy for you to set up some kind of sprinkler system. Um, down below here on the bottom just shows you the way they do it commercially with these big rainbird impact sprinklers and they throw a lot of water out there the first week after planting to keep those plants alive. Um, as you can imagine boxing up bare root plants when you've got to plant millions of them is, is a more efficient way to go than plugs. 
But given the scale of a homeowner, cost is not gonna be as prohibitive, and I would say go with plug transplants. Another thing you can do is you can take, uh, you can get plants like this, and if they come with leaves on, you can just chop those leaves off before you plant. Just chop them off about one to two inches above the crown. And basically what you're doing is you're removing a lot of the, the leaves, which are, are gonna be what wicks water out of that plant and can cause issues. And you're still gonna wanna do a little overhead watering, but it can be pretty minimal just during the hot part of the day for the first week after planting or until you see some new leaves starting to come out. So that's another trick you can use is if you can't get plugs and you get bare roots, but the leaves are fresh on them, you can cut those leaves off just plant them, use minimal overhead irrigation. They're gonna be slower to grow that way. So you might wanna get them in the ground a little earlier, push them a little harder with fertilizer, but that is a, you know, a trick that you can use to make a bare root plant work for you if you don't wanna overhead irrigate for a little while. All right, transplant sources. Uh, I get a lot of calls trying to find Florida strawberry varieties in Florida because your, your, your varieties from up north from other places are just not going to work here. They're not adapted to here. And so people want to know how can I get the transplant type that or, or the, the, the varieties that the growers grow in the Plant City area in Florida, the, the strawberries that I can get in the Florida winter. Well, that's a, that's a little challenging. And the reason is, hold on one second here. The reason that's challenging is that most of the nurseries that serve Florida, they're in places like Northern California, the Appalachian Mountains, or in Southern Canada. And they grow millions upon millions of transplants. The Florida industry uh, does 10,000 acres. There's 180 million plants planted by hand every year in that industry. So, you know, if you call, try to call up one of these nurseries and say, I want a thousand plants, they're not going to want to deal with that. So one of the things that I recommend is if through your extension or through a garden club or something like that, you basically put combine orders as groups and make a larger order uh, to order from one of these nurseries. If you can get at least 5,000 plant order, 10,000 would be even better. And if you were willing to go to a packing house in Plant City to pick those up so that the grower doesn't have to ship them a separate place and then come and bring them back for your friends, that can be a way to go. Even then, I would recommend going with a nursery that's more, a smaller nursery that's more prone to serving smaller quantities. So th th there is a variation in these nurseries that serve Florida. And a couple of the nurseries that I've known to uh, serve smaller orders are Laro in Quebec, and I've got the, the the number of the salesman on there, and G W Allen in Nova Scotia. Okay, and I've got the sales office number there. And again, these slides will be available on request from Bill by email. But um, keep in mind, Laro is going to have plug plants and bare root plants. G W Allen is typically going to only have bare root plants. But those are the two nurseries that I would start with. They might refer you to another nursery if they can't serve you. But that's one way to go is combine an order and go to one of these, these larger nurseries. Another way to go is I have heard that Parksdale Farms, which is a fairly famous place to get your strawberry shortcake and your, your milkshakes and so forth in the Plant City area, will occasionally sell small lots of uh, strawberry plants in the fall. You can call close to the fall and check that out. Um, if you have a connection with a local strawberry grower, that may be one possibility. There's a grower called Ferris Farms uh, up in Floral City that might not be too terribly far from you. They might be willing to order some extra plants uh, and sell a few to you on the side, for example. Or you can call the Florida Strawberry Growers Association and they might be willing to help you work through a grower to find a few plants. Those are another couple of options. But this first, this, this first option with nurseries likely to ship smaller orders is the first one that I would recommend you go with. All right, now in terms of what varieties to grow, um, the Florida homeowner Edis that I sent you is already out of date in terms of varieties. Varieties change fast in Florida. Um, 
when you look at this graph, this is the projected acreage for the coming season in the Plant City area. And it's basically two varieties, Brilliance and Sensation, both of which are UF varieties. And then Driscoll's grows their own proprietary varieties. They're about 10% uh, of the acreage and you can't access those varieties. So in terms of publicly available varieties, Brilliance or Sensation is what the growers are growing. And these are the varieties that I would recommend you growing as well. We, we have some other uh, varieties that I'll talk to you about, but these are the primary recommendations. My number one recommendation is Brilliance because I think it's gonna be easier for you to manage in a home gar garden context. Um, but both of these are possibilities for you. Okay, Sensation is a very large sized fruit and it's a very sweet tasting. High sugars, a real fruity aroma. Uh, it's a fantastically flavored strawberry and that's uh, the, the flavor and the size are the primary reasons why it's grown um, the way it is uh, in the Plant City area. Uh, it's also a pretty vigorous plant. Uh, and so in a home gardening context, where it's a little bit harder to push large amounts of fertility like some of these commercial growers do, that can be an advantage for you. So um, if that sounds like a good combo for your growing system, then I would highly recommend uh, Sensation. Uh, as I said, it has large fruit size, very sweet flavor, maintains its bricks even late in the season. So as you get into March, April, when the weather's getting hot, it can still taste pretty good. So in terms of the duration of the season, it can do really well from start to finish. Uh, the fruit does have a lighter external color compared to some of the other varieties. If you grow the plant too large and you're not getting sunlight on the berries, that can be a problem with this variety. So because of the vigorous plant um, and uh, the fact that the, uh, it's really helpful to get as much sun as possible on the fruit to get them to redden up well, um, Pain, planting this at a little bit wider spacing than Brilliance is recommended. So just keep that in mind for sensation. Brilliance, as I said, is the number one variety uh, in Florida. Part of the reason for that is it's a very attractive fruit. You can see the shine um, and gloss on the fruit. It's very high yielding. Um, it's got a plant that's a little bit more moderated in size, a little bit better disease resistance. Um, just easy to grow and a good quality fruit and very early producing. Um, it's got this kind of upright plant that allows the, the fruit to be exposed and easily visualized, which is, which is really nice in terms of keeping airflow around the fruit, reducing diseases, that kind of thing. And it has better powdery mildew resistance than sensation, so it's just a little bit easier to manage. And that's why I would recommend this as your number one variety. It's a good flavored strawberry. Uh, not quite as good as Sensation. Uh, sensation is just fantastic, but still a good flavor and uh, highly recommended. We do have another variety that was released a few years ago called Florida Beauty. Um, this has great flavor as well, but a little bit more of an acid kick uh, compared to Sensation. So if you like a nice tartness to your strawberry, this would be a potential variety to try. It's not as easy to grow as the other two varieties though. Um, what, what's unusual about this is, so, so most of our varieties in Florida are short day varieties, okay? Which means that they start initiating flowers as the days are getting shorter in the fall, because we're growing strawberries in the winter in Florida. And so naturally that would seem to be the type of variety that would work best. Florida Beauty is our first day neutral strawberry, meaning that it's the type of strawberry you could plant farther north and it would flower through the summer, even through the long days. So it flowers regardless of the day length, which is why it's called day neutral. So it's actually a variety, surprisingly, that's found more success outside of Florida than in Florida. But if you're looking for just a, a smaller berry with a little bit more acid kick and just a really deep red color, uh, if that's really attractive to you, you can try to find some Florida beauty. It's not gonna be as, as available as these other varieties from these nurseries, but Loro should have probably some Florida beauty if you wanna try it out. Um, so it's going to flower right away. In fact, you're probably it's going to flower so fast you want to trim the first flowers just to allow the plant some some time to develop before it puts on a, a load of fruit. It's a very compact plant. Um, fruit are a little bit smaller. Uh, the challenge in a home garden is it's going to be hard to push enough nitrogen to really get this plant to develop ideally in terms of yield. 
But one thing you could do is just plant it on a closer spacing. You could probably even plant them 10, 12 inches apart um, and, and increase your yield on a per area basis that way. So potential variety to try, but if you haven't grown strawberries before, I'd say start with Brilliance. Maybe move to this one later if you, if you um, have the, the idea to. Now, uh, it hasn't gotten a name yet. We just put out a new release that's actually a white fruited strawberry. So I don't know if you've heard about these. They're pretty popular in Japan. Uh, we got some seed from Japan a number of years ago, crossed them in with our Florida material, and eventually we're able to develop a white fruited variety. So these, these, these uh, fruit that you see right here, and this is from a, a trial we did at Ferris Farms in Floral City. And, and by the way, Ferris Farms has a, a garden stand and they're probably gonna be selling some at their stand this year uh, in Floral City. But um, these are fully ripe and ready to eat. They, um, you can tell they're ripe when they have a little bit of pink blush on the outside. And you can see some of these fruit like there have just a little bit of pink on them. That means they're ripe and ready to eat. Um, they're sweet. Uh, but they have this more pineapple-y type aroma. It's a very different flavor from a typical strawberry. So it's just a totally different product. Um, and something obviously a homeowner might be interested in trying. The, the plants are going to be pretty robust and easy to grow, kind of like Brilliance. Um, in about two years to three years, these plants will be more, much more available. So if you start hearing about these or seeing them in the supermarkets, this is what they are. Uh, and you might be able to get some plants within a couple to three years if you want to try them at home. But just wanted to throw that out there as something that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, there's a couple more pictures of what they look like when they're ripe a little later in the season. When it gets a little hotter, they develop a little bit more of a pink uh, 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 look to them uh, when they're ripe. The hotter it is, the more pink they are at, uh, at ripeness. And also another key to the ripeness, you can see that the, the seeds on the outside are red. When those turn red, that's another indicator of, uh, of ripeness of the fruit. All right, so a little, a couple of management points by variety. If you're gonna try Brilliance, like I suggest, and you have some kind of crown rot, um, you know, where the plants are collapsing and going down, it's likely to be Phytophthora. So just keep that in mind. We do have a plant uh, disease diagnostic clinic at GCREC. If you go to our GCREC website, you can find a way to, to if you want to drive down and or mail a sample, you can get it diagnosed because depending on what kind of crown rot is, it could, could be a completely different uh, chemical that you may need to use to control it. Um, but just keep that in mind for both brilliance and sensation. If your plants are going down to some kind of crown or root rot, it's likely Phytophthora and um, and that can be key in, in, in treating it. For sensation, it's got some powdery mildew susceptibility, so you're gonna to wanna to watch out for that. Um, there are sulfur products that you can use for powdery mildew um, that are very safe and that work pretty well. So just keep in, in mind that sulfur products are probably the best way for a homeowner to go in terms of powdery mildew. And again, like I said, sen sensation, make sure that the plants are spaced out enough that the fruit have good sun exposure. You can even trim some lower leaves if you want, uh, but make sure those fruit are exposed some, somewhat to the sun and, and the air. For beauty, crown rots are more likely to be anthracnose diseases than, uh, than Phytophthora because it has some Phytophthora resistance, but it's gonna need more fertilizer than the others and it's gonna be overall a little bit more difficult to grow. So I wouldn't start with that one if it's your first time trying strawberries. All right, fertilization. The home gardening edis, if you're gonna be gardening in the soil, recommends two pounds of 10, 5, 10, or equivalent per 10 feet of row. And all or at least half of that should be slow release formulation. Strawberries like it slightly acid. We can have problems with high pH soils here in Florida. So if you see some, a lot of yellowing in your plants, chances are you've got a high pH and you've got iron chlorosis issues because strawberries do like it a little bit acid. So you probably wanna do a soil test and, and uh, unless you've just got a very organic soil and on a raised bed, you put lots of compost and manure and things, you're probably gonna be fine. But if you're kind of more in the sandy soil, keep in mind that pH. I would recommend Osmocote or some slow release because of the duration of the season. And I would say just as a rule of thumb, under fertilization is more likely to be a problem than over fertilization. If you're, if you're pumping too much fertilizer, you'll see a bush that's getting a little too vigorous, a little too fast. 
soft fruit, that kind of thing. But that's going to be a little harder to achieve in a home garden context. Um, I would say if it's your first time growing strawberries, err a little bit on the side of fertilizing a little bit more than less um, if you're trying to figure out the right balance uh, and see how that goes. In terms of diseases and pests, uh, for pests, I think the two primary ones you're going to want to watch out for are thrips and mites. So we have uh, chili thrips as well as western flower thrips. And a lot of times what you see with those is you see this bronzing uh, of the fruit where the thrips are feeding around the seeds uh, in, the, in the flower it's as, de as it's developing and the young fruit. And then you start seeing that as the fruit are getting into the larger green stage or even starting to ripen. If you see this type of bronzing on the fruit, that's probably thrips. And then you've got two spotted spider mites are probably the other major one that you're gonna watch for. If you see this kind of stippling, this little yellow pinprick look on the top of the leaf, turn it over and use a little magnifying glass and see if you've got some two spotted spider mites um, under there. If it gets bad, you'll see webbing like this, but if you've let it get that far, um, you know, you're gonna have a hard time controlling it. Mites are one of those things that you've gotta catch early. So it's something that you want to be scouting for and, and regularly turning over leaves and looking, looking and seeing what you have. In terms of pests and diseases, I'm going to click on this link. This is a fantastic um, uh, visual look at different strawberry diseases in Florida. You'll notice that the crown rots when you open up the crown look very similar. That's why if you have a crown rot, it's good to get it diagnosed at our disease clinic. If you have angular leaf spot, which is a bacterial disease, which you have, will have this kind of water-soaked look on the underside of the leaves, there's really no good control for it. So the best thing you can do is just um, wait <laughs> and hope it gets better. Um, but these pictures of Botrytis, anthracnose fruit rot, powdery mildew, um, and, and then these ones on the bottom are a lot less um, common. But I think the main thing to point out is that there's a lot of fungal diseases that attack strawberries in Florida, and particularly if we're having a little bit of a wet season, I would recommend some kind of regular broad spectrum fungicide spray just because of all the different fungi that can attack strawberries. What I would recommend is uh, the chemical name Captan. Uh, it's, it's a fairly, it's a multi-site fungicide with broad spectrum uses. It controls anthracnose, botrytis a little bit, and some of these others. If the weather's on the little on the wet side, you can spray that about every week uh, on your plants, um, every two or three weeks if the weather's um, cool and dry. Um, I'm not sure what the homeowner formulations of Captan are, but you can Google Captan and homeowner formulations, and I believe there's some ortho and high yield and other formulations that you can use. Um, down here, there are a list of other fungicides. These are a lot of these are ones that, that growers are going to be using. You'll see Captan is down here at the bottom. Most of these are things that you're not going to probably want to invest in as a homeowner. But if you've got some Captan for these broad fun fungicides, some sulfur for powdery mildew, which would not be controlled by Captan, um, those are probably the two main most useful things that you're going to want to have in terms of uh, fungicides. Uh, in terms of managing thrips and mites, um, those are going to be a little bit more difficult um, because uh, those, those chemicals can be pretty um, specific. It's, if it's thrips, uh, spinosad, that, I mean there are some homeowner formulations of things, but Bill would probably have to give you some more advice on uh, what, what the best homeowner products are for mites and thrips. All right, and with, with that, I'm a little past 1030, so I want to go ahead and stop and start fielding questions at this point. Let me look in the chat and see what we have. Um, I've got um, a couple of comments. One, I'd like a copy of the slides, so, so please email Bill for that. His email is in the chat. How do I locate non-GMO seeds or plants? Great question. Uh, none of our varieties are, are GMO. Um, these are all conventionally bred varieties, you know, by taking pollen, moving it from one plant to another, selecting the best seedlings, and so on. Um, there are, in fact, no strawberry varieties on the market that I'm aware of right now that are GMO. So 
you're going to be pretty safe in that regard if that's what you're concerned about. Um, but just keep in mind that none of the varieties that I've talked about today are GMO. Uh, second question, I live in Dry Branch, uh, Georgia. What variety would you recommend and when would be the best to plant? Uh, Brilliance is sounding good. Um, Brilliance is indeed what I would recommend you to plant. Um, given that you're a little bit uh, cooler up there in central Georgia, what I would say is that you probably want to just make sure that your planting date is not too late. In other words, if you were planting at the end of October, I'd say it's a little bit too late. It's going to be a little too cold at planting time. You're going to have a hard time getting the plant to develop before uh, the winter really gets a lot colder. So if you're in central Georgia, what I would recommend is trying to plant towards the beginning of October. Uh, and that's going to give you a little bit better chance, as well as if you want to put some, you know, PVC hoops over your beds and put a little bit of uh, uh, clear plastic over those to make yourself a little bit of a tunnel up in that area to keep them going during that colder weather. That could be a good idea. You can use some kind of uh, uh, frost control cloth as well that you can pull over those hoops and then just pull off again uh, when it's sunnier and warmer. Uh, and that, that can really be a good way to go in a place like central Georgia. Um, question from Linda Stavely, do you plant in full sun? Absolutely, I didn't mention that, but absolutely you gotta, you gotta have full sun for strawberries. Um, you can maybe get away with a couple of hours of shade during the day, but you really need a full sun site to grow strawberries properly, strawberries properly. Less, best planting time up in Jacksonville Beach. Up in Jacksonville Beach, I would go with uh, mid-October. Um, October, you could go slightly earlier October, end of the first week of October, say the 7th or 8th, but I would target that October 15th date again. All right. Okay, we had a couple questions over in the chat box also. Okay. Let's see. Let me see if I can find this chat box. I'm going to stop sharing and I think that'll allow me to see that. There we go. Okay, so we got a copy of the slides. We got the links. Excellent. Um, do they always have to be elevated beds? No, they don't have to, but they're gonna be easier to access and manage and pick if they are slightly raised. So if you don't wanna build a bed that's, you know, 10 inches off the ground or a foot off the ground, even if you just raise them up four or five inches, it's probably a good idea. Can you specifically show how to plant bare root at crown level with the leaf trimming in a vertical drip system? Okay, so basically, um, if you're in a, in a hydro stacker or something, something like that, um, plug plants are really gonna be a lot easier for you because it can be difficult to get sprinkler irrigation to all those plants and all those different geometries around that hydro stacker. So I would really um, recommend uh, plugs. But if you need to use bare roots where you're cutting off the leaves, um, you can use pretty minimal sprinkler irrigation. You're just going to want, it's going to be pretty obvious where the stem comes in the top and the roots come in the bottom. And then you're going to have a little area, a little, a little small area where there's no roots or leaves. It's just going to look like fleshy tissue. That's the crown. And basically you just want to look at that crown and you want the middle of that crown to be right at the soil level. So just centralize that crown right at the level of the soil as much as possible. Um, please explain bricks. Sorry, that's a little bit of <laughs> <laughs> jargon that I didn't realize I was using. That's soluble solids content. content. It's, a, it's, a, it's approximation for sugar. So when I say it has high bricks, I'm just saying that it has high sugars uh, in the fruit compared to the other varieties. Um, some good info. Where do we find white fruited variety? We're hoping that the white fruited variety would be available from the same nursery sources that I mentioned, but it's gonna be probably two more seasons before it's available. So if, if you're in the fall of 2022, 
you can ask those nurseries if they have those white fruited strawberries. I'm hoping that they'll eventually be in the box stores and garden centers and things like that um, because it's, it's something that we believe people are gonna wanna access that way. But probably in two years from the same nursery sources I mentioned is the best place to start. If you ask this fall or the next fall, there's probably not gonna be any availability. All right, could I plant in an earth box? Absolutely you can. Um, when to plant in Pasco, I would say October 15th um, as well. Uh, that's really a good date for most of the state unless you're way down in Homestead or you're way up in the Panhandle. Um, Putnam County, where is Putnam County, Bill? Um, I'm gonna have to look this up. Where is that? That's north of here. I'm not a, I'm not a uh, native Floridian. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. I'm a North Carolina boy from where the hills are rolling up in the yeah, Piedmont. No hills here. Okay, Putnam, okay, we're just east of Gainesville. Okay, uh, yeah, in Gainesville, again, I would say October 15th is a great, a great time. Um, you could potentially go a little early, you know, uh, October 7th, end of the first week in October up in Gainesville, but I think the 15th is a great, uh, is a great time. As, as far as covering plants with a high tunnel, if you put some PVC hoops over your, over your beds, you could use either some kind of frost cloth. I'm not sure where you would get it in a homeowner. Um, you probably type. have to order that online. Yeah, you probably have yeah. to order that. You could even use some, some clear plastic, something that's um, thick enough that it's tough if you wanna pull it over at night and then pull it off during the day. But either way, you're probably gonna wanna whatever you put over those hoops, you're gonna want it to be retract easily retractable so that you know, during the day you can get more sun and more airflow. If you if you're keep have a fairly small sort of little tunnel and you're keeping it closed all the time, you're gonna get so much humidity in there that you're gonna have lots of mildew, lots of botrytis, all kinds of problems. So if you're gonna have a, a little bit of a tunnel, you're just gonna to wanna to be aware that you're only gonna to wanna to use that tunnel when it's particularly cold and that you're gonna to need to, to take it off at other times. That's just uh, important. Okay, next question. If I could find brilliant seeds, could I try to grow them that way or just find a nursery for plants? So these varieties are not propagated by seed. Uh, they're, they're only vegetatively propagated. So the only way to access these plants is through a nursery it's multiplying them either in plugs or in a field nursery for the bare roots. So uh, you'll wanna access that uh, slide that I have in the presentation that Bill's gonna make available um, where I give some suggestions of the nurseries to go to. Um, I heard that strawberries really last for two years and you have to remove them and then plant the new strawberry runners. Is that the case? In Florida, unfortunately, it's not the case uh, because of our summers. If you're uh, you know, used to strawberries up in the north or the mid-Atlantic, um, you can grow them in these matted rows and sort of let them run during the summer. You know, just have some straw mulch, they'll overwinter, that type of thing. Unfortunately, Florida, due to the harshness of the temperatures and the rains in our summers, it's just not possible or advisable to really try to oversummer those strawberries. Um, you're going to have much better quality the second year, much better survivability. Um, hold on just Sorry about that. Um, you're going to want to plant them every year just like the commercial growers do. Um, it, it, it's, it's really not advised. Um, you're going to lose plants over the summer to disease, or if you don't lose them over the summer, sometime in the fall, you'll lose them, <laughs> you know, you're, you're most likely to end up with uh, bare ground if you're trying, eventually, if you're trying to oversummer strawberries in Florida. Yeah, and let me add that when homeowners try doing something like that, holding over plants that commercial growers don't grow that way, what they end up doing is using a lot more water, fertilizer, um, pesticides, whatever it might be, to try to save those plants during the time of year where they're not gonna grow well here. And we don't want to see people putting that, you know, spending that much money and time applying them and also putting all those things into the environment. Because we see that an awful lot with people trying to grow their vegetables during the summer. 
unless it's okra or black eyed peas, they do well. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, most everything else is not going to do well in the heat of summer. So you really want to try to follow the, um, uh, the proper planting times for everything to help keep your, your material and chemical control costs down. Absolutely. Well said. Um, let's see. Next question on here from EV Stack. Can you plant from seeds, seeds from fruit? Okay. Well, you can try, but it's not going to go well. Um, basically, uh, the, the seeds don't germinate. Uh, very well. There, there's some specific treatments you have to get them to get them to germinate well. And if you grow, if you're successful in growing a plant from that, the plant is not going to resemble the original variety that it came from. Uh, this, the plant is going to be very stunted. The fruit are going to be very small. They're not going to taste good. It's basically just going to be a very poor quality plant and fruit. And that's because um, the type of variety that strawberries are the reason they're propagated vegetatively by basically cloning them over and over again is that um, they're, they're not like a, an heirloom tomato where you can save the seed off of them. Each of those seeds that's on the outside of that strawberry, they're kind of like you and your siblings. You all resemble your parent, but you're all a little different. Um, they're all gonna be a little different what comes from those seeds, but it's gonna be worse because of the inbreeding depression in strawberry. They're gonna be very stunted, and very poor. So you can't really save the seeds from strawberry fruit and get anything good from them, unfortunately. Like Bill said, you're just gonna to wanna to keep, find a good quality plant source and just keep going back to that every fall. Okay, um, at what temperature do you need the strawberry, do strawberries need to be, oh, wait a minute, no, sorry, I missed the one just above that. Is, is it possible to plant strawberries in like a five gallon pot? It's absolutely possible to, to plant strawberries in some type of container, absolutely. Um, that can be a good way to do it. Um, th the only challenge with some kind of round or large container um, is the spacing of the plants. It, generally, you wanna space the plants to where the fruit are easily visible, that there's good airflow, because otherwise you're looking at diseases and problems like that. Generally what I, I see or sometimes see in containers, especially large ones where you've got plants in the middle that aren't getting as good a circulation is you tend to harbor a lot of botrytis and mildew and things in there and it can be a little difficult to manage. But if you're, if you're good at container gardening, if you feel like you can space them out nicely within the container, absolutely, it's very possible to grow them in containers. Uh, just like you would grow them in a, in a say a, a framed raised bed or something like that. Bill, any comments on, on that? No, um, I know that people grow them hydroponically very uh, frequently, and many vegetables do really well um, in pots. I grow a lot of what I have, you know, what little I have growing in my yard in containers. But yeah, that is a good point that if it's sitting inside the container, it may just get a little too humid around the plant, and you're going to start having disease problems. Okay, at what temperature do you need the strawberries to be covered? Well, as far as when you, when you really have to cover them, it's really just when you get a freeze. Um, if you're expecting a freeze, then I would recommend covering the strawberries. Now, if you, if you wanna get a little more aggressive and manage them even, even, even more finely to try to get more yield off of those strawberries, you can, you can cover them anytime it's gonna get below 40 degrees at night, just as long as you uncover them the next morning once the temperatures go back up again. Again, because if you're covering them more, you're gonna trap more humidity and that can cause problems. So you only need to cover them when it's gonna freeze. If you wanna cover them below 40 Fahrenheit, that's fine too. Just remember that you've once the temperature gets up a little bit um, and gets up above 40, you're gonna to wanna to get that, that cover off as quickly as possible. Okay, what kind of nutrients do I need to add to the soil in the earth box, if any? Um, you know, it, in any kind of containerized raised bed system, like I said for strawberries, I think you're gonna wanna air a little bit more on the side of being a little more aggressive with the fertilizer until you get comfortable with growing strawberries, just because 
the common thing that homeowners fall into is not fertilizing them enough. And then basically they don't, they don't make enough crowns on the plant before winter. And then for the rest of the season, it kind of stunts the yields that you're going to get off of this plant. You want to grow a plant that's about, you know, by December, you want to grow a plant that's about a foot high, that has multiple crowns, and that's already putting off fruit in December. And so if you're not seeing that kind of development on your plants, you're probably not fertilizing them quite enough. So if you're using Osmocote or some type of nice, uh, good quality, slow release fertilizer, you're going to want to go with at least the recommendation on the box. You know, sometimes it's, a, depending on the formulation, a tablespoon per plant a certain size. You might want to go even over that a little bit um, just, to, just to start with, just to make sure you're getting enough. But it kind of depends on the, what you're filling that earth box with. I mean, if you've got a bunch of very fertile compost and manures and things in there, that's obviously going to reduce what you're going to need to apply in addition. Let me ask also, do strawberries have any um, unusual micronutrient requirements? Um, I wouldn't say anything unusual. I'd say most of the problems you get into is when your pH is too high. Then you have okay. iron issues. You can start to have some boron issues. Um, you know, generally our soils are, are pretty high in phosphorus and that's why I said, you know, the 10, 5, 10 or equivalent, that middle number doesn't need to be very high. However, I suppose if you're in a, say, a raised bed context or something where you're not in a, a Florida soil, you're more in something organic, you probably want a more balanced fertilizer, you know, where those numbers are more the same. Because phosphorus is important. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have a lot of it in our sandy soils. Yeah, I know for anybody watching who's in Hernando County, we generally have plenty of phosphorus, not always. But most soil tests I look at have are you know high in phosphorus, and um, our pH tends to be all over the place. It can range from low all the way. I see eight point fives on a regular basis. So, yeah. So if you're going to be growing it in the soil in Hernando County, you may want to contact us for a soil test first. And yeah. obviously, we have people from all over the country who are asking questions here. So yeah. you know your your situation may be different where you live. Yeah, yeah. Just watch those high pHs. If you see the leaves yellowing, uh, particularly the younger leaves. Okay, sometimes if you get the older leaves yellowing, that can be nitrogen if you're not putting enough nitrogen on. But if you're seeing the younger leaves yellowing, that's very likely a high pH issue and you're not getting enough iron. Um, uh, so if you see this kind of chlorosis going on, uh, that's, a, that's a clue that your pH is too high. Um, you know, so tilling in some organic matter using some sulfur, soil amendment, could be important but like bill said don't make assumptions get a soil test yeah because you could just never tell if you're in in a development where you got some subsoil you could be at an 8.5 yep if, we see if, it if, if, if they kept some top soil you know where you're at um if you're in in a, in a home that was built much longer ago you might be fine and 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 you're wasting resources if you're you're adding sulfur to your soil so uh, like bill said it's kind of like disease diagnostics you're, you're wasting chemicals if you're treating the wrong disease. Um, same thing with fertility. You're wasting resources if you're treating the wrong thing. Um, so definitely uh, use re Bill's resources there. Okay, um, what about Central Georgia? How long will my strawberry plants last? Um, it really depends on uh, the temperatures. Uh, you know, strawberries, as you get into the spring, if you're getting multiple days in the 90s, your strawberry days are numbered. The, the plants will still grow, but their ability to continue to flower and produce quality, good quality fruit will, will decrease very quickly. So um, it's not really a, I mean, the plants will last a long time, uh, but they'll start runnering, uh, the, the fruit quality will be poor. Um, you'll know it. <laughs> when <laughs> when your strawberry quality is really starting to tank and that's usually associated with with just hot weather do i have any thoughts on the sweet charlie variety um sweet charlie is an old florida variety released in 1992 that's still used in a number of places because of uh the sweet flavor sensation is actually a better flavored strawberry than sweet charlie and has better shelf life better size um, so I would really recommend going with one of the newer varieties. If you like the flavor of Sweet Charlie, I would go with Sensation. 
um, because I just think it'll work a little bit better for you. You can certainly continue to grow it. If it works well for you, that's great. There are some locations or growing styles where, where a certain variety will work. But uh, I would just, if, you're, if you like Sweet Charlie, I would just experiment with Sensation uh, and, and see if that might be, be a better choice for you. Will these varieties work in a vertical drip system? They absolutely will. Unfortunately, I don't have personal experience with drip systems. Um, uh, I mean, obviously I've, I've, I've seen them working and, and people in the Plant City area and other places make them work well. But unfortunately, I'm not a good authority on that. Bill may be able to help you a lot better or be able to direct you to somebody who has the right experience. I know they work well in the um, hydroponic tower, the vertigro type systems, and it's a very popular um, way of growing. You pick strawberries, but as far as what varieties they specifically use, I'm not really sure. I would assume any of the newer varieties are going to do well. Any of these will work will yeah. work very well. Yeah, yeah. There, there's really people ask me that a lot, and there's really between. I mean, there's so many different ways to grow strawberries in the ground, under tunnels, in a, in a hydro stacker, in a coconut core bag, mm -hmm. um, you know, on a, on, a, on a metal platform. We just haven't really found any clear, you know, varieties that just, you know, say don't perform well in one of those. They seem to perform well relative to each other in all of these systems. So I would choose the variety just based on the the characteristics that I described and what you think you would prefer. I, I think on a, all of them will work well in all growing systems there. Like I said, sensation's a little bit more vigorous than, than brilliance, which is more vigorous than beauty. If you, have a, if you prefer a closer spacing, then you would probably go with a brilliance or a beauty. If you want a more vigorous plant, you would go with a sensation. But, you know, really the, more specific than that, it's, it's really hard to recommend a variety one over another based on a, on, a, on a growing system. Okay, next question. Are there strawberry seeds you can get in heirloom anymore? So, not, you know, for Fregaria ananassa, the, the cultivated strawberry, none of the varieties are seed propagated. As I mentioned before, they're all vegetatively propagated. If you try to plant the seeds from the strawberry, they will not uh, work well or resemble the original variety. Uh, some people do grow uh, strawberry from seed of other species, though. So if you're growing a species called Fregaria vesca, which produces these little small strawberries about the size of your thumbnail, some of them which have, you know, unique aromas and things like that. They're called the Frey de Bois or the Woodland strawberries. You can buy the seeds online sometimes. Those can be grown. Uh, some of those lines can be grown by seed, but those are not the strawberry that we're talking about today. These are very tiny, very soft strawberries um, that are really not that great to eat, but they do have some unusual aromas and sometimes people like to play around with them, but it's really not the same species. Is the white variety a GMO or a crossbreed? So it's, it's not GMO, uh, it's just a crossbreed. So, there are strawberries in nature that are naturally white. Uh, basically what happens is that there's been some just naturally occurring mutations that have basically um, made the gene for producing the red pigment non-functional. And, and so uh, it just doesn't produce the red pigment and therefore you have a white strawberry. And so that's a, a naturally occurring uh, thing in nature. And so basically what we did is we just harnessed that across some of that material, actually material that we got in Japan that had been bred a little bit from the wild. Um, but basically Japanese strawberry germplasm crossed it with Florida strawberry germplasm and got the white uh, color uh, into, or maybe I should say out of <laughs> the Florida variety. So no, the white is not a result of gene jockeying. It's something that's natural, developed through crossbreeding. Can you put strawberries in with other vegetables in a garden box. You certainly can. Um, I'm not sure I would recommend it because strawberries, um, they're so unique in their requirements and their management compared to so many other types of fruits and vegetables. I would recommend just planting strawberries in whatever bed or box or area that you have um, because 
I think that they're going to require some different management. And keep in mind that if you manage them well, they're going to last a long time through the winter. And most vegetables aren't going to necessarily last that long. And so then you run into issues with the interplanting, with having something go out in season and having to try to replace it. I would recommend that you just grow strawberries in whatever area or bed that you're, that you're using. Uh, let's see. Christina was in central Georgia asking that question. Okay, yes. Would I need to trade out for new plants? Yes, in central <clears throat> Georgia, you'll also need to replant every year. I would highly recommend that. Um, even though you would have some more success trying to carry those over, the, the strawberries that you get the next fall are just going to be much lower quality than what you would if you had replanted the plants with clean stock. And you're also going to have less disease problems, less other problems. I would really not recommend trying to carry over plants over the summer. The only area I would recommend doing that is when you're much farther north um, uh, in the United States and when you're growing very different varieties from the type that, that we grow. I see that Christina also asked, um, I have some alpine strawberry seeds. Should I even bother planting these? Um, uh, you know, sure, why not? Except for just don't expect a, a typical strawberry from them. Just expect something that's very small, uh, aromatic, but, but a little bit mealy. Um, maybe something that you would use to make jam, but not something that you would really enjoy eating fresh. That may be something, because I grew up in Maryland, and I remember like wild strawberries mm -hmm. that you find growing like in the lawn and right. in the woods. Yep. And they got the really, really small. It was a strawberry, but yep. not yep. like what you buy at the store. With the little seeds that are kind of extruding more on the outside yep. of the fruit. Yep. yep. That's most likely a, a, a subspecies of Fregaria vesca, the woodland strawberry. It's one of the ancient ancestors of the cultivated strawberry. Um, but yeah, it's just totally different. And, and, and that's basically what, what you're getting is something that's the size of your pinky nail. And um, yeah, it's something that doesn't have the same. Uh, it's not really the same. Uh, okay, uh, last question I see on the chat here. Thank you. Where can we purchase Cap Captain? Okay, so I realize I need to s spell the chemical <laughs> name for you. So it's called Captan. It's C A P T A N. So it's like Captain, but without the I. Okay. So if you were to Google Captan and homeowner formulation or something like that, that might be a way to go. Better yet, I'll bet Bill will do a little bit of research and maybe recommend uh, something for you. But Captan is the, is the chemical name. It's not the brand name. So the key is going to be to find some kind of brand name that you can find at a box store or a garden center that has the chemical Captan in it. Um, and so, Bill, if you wouldn't mind, uh, <laughs> maybe you can sure. recommend. I, I Google it, and right near the top, uh, there's a variety made by Bonide, B-O-N-I-D-E, and that's a company that makes different pesticides, and they sell it on Amazon.com. So you can get pretty much everything on Amazon. Yep, <laughs> indeed. <clears throat> they, and there's keep... a couple other um, uh, products here, a couple other um, companies that make it. So yeah, it's, it's readily available. Uh, I see under related searches for Captan fungicide at Lowe's. So I would assume that the big box stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, larger lawn and garden centers would carry it. Um, I see High Yield makes their own version of it. So it's not that difficult to find as long as you know that it's Captan is the active ingredient you're looking for. It's probably not going to be in big letters on the front of the label. Exactly, exactly. It's the active ingredient and it's it's kind of a broad spectrum. It's been around a long, long time. It's a, it's, it's a fairly old chemical. So like, it's, like Bill says, it's not going to be difficult to find. It's just keep in mind, it's not going to be the brand name. It's the active ingredient. Yeah, just like um, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about pests of strawberries and thrips can be a problem. Uh, very good control for thrips is spinosin or spinosad. Mm -hmm. And there is a homeowner version that you could, that I have seen sold at the big box stores. 
It's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. I'm not making that up, and I didn't make up the name for that either. <laughs> so if you go to a Lowe's or Home Depot, you should be able to find it at one or the other or both. Look for Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, and that's a very good um, – that's approved for organic production also for anybody who's interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Very safe to use. Very good thrips control. Yeah, Spinosad's very good. In fact, I think I just sprayed some from Fertilome uh, on my, my knockout rows the other day. Yeah, um, yeah, they get it really bad. They get chili thrips pretty bad, and that's one of the thrips that attacks strawberry as, as well. So in strawberry, if you see – a little bit, say, like on your roses where the leaves are looking like there's some little dark areas around the veins and the leaves are starting to crinkle up a little bit and, the, and you get this sort of darker or tea colored look to the, the, the little stems. You probably got chili thrips and spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, mm -hmm. uh, or the formulation that Bill mentioned. Um, you know, one of those formulations is the way to go for, for thrips. Okay. Christina says she's bought Captain Jack's before. So you got a Captain uh, so? Jack's aficionado. <laughs> she's familiar with it. <laughs> yes. And I think um, there's a couple more questions back on the Q&A. Yeah, okay. Wow. Is, is there a product that contains both Captan and sulfur? Um, there may be, but you know, I wouldn't really recommend applying those together. So Captan is for most of those um, uh, kind of fungi that, that attack of strawberries except for powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is a kind of in a little bit of a different category. It's biologically a little different, attacks the plant a little differently. And so generally you have very different chemicals that control powdery mildew versus say anthracnose and, and, and uh, botrytis and these things that attack the fruit. So what I would recommend is that you just use some sulfur product like microthiol, or there's lots of sulfur formulations. So usually they can, they can come in a powder, but generally just get something that you can mix up in a spray because you're gonna wanna monitor. And if you see mildew, spray sulfur. Um, but if you're not, don't, don't, don't spray it without the mildew being there. In other words, don't use resources when there's, there's not something you're treating because sulfur will not handle the, fung the fungi that captan will and vice versa, you know. Sulfur is very specific to powdery mildew. And powdery mildew is usually pretty easy to see because the leaves start curling. Yeah. You get this powdery look on the underside of the leaf, sometimes on the upper side of the leaf. You can get it on the, the seeds of the strawberry. We'll start to get this little powdery look on them. If you see that, you want to go to sulfur. All right. Um, Let's see, another question from Kay. This is non-toxic to environment. None of the chemicals that we've mentioned today, we would recommend if we didn't believe that they were safe, both for you and the environment to apply. Um, uh, as long as you apply them according to the label, that you're applying them basically in the amount that is recommended and at the frequency that's recommended for, for the crop. If you start applying them inconsistent with the label, then you can get into uh, environmental issues or human safety issues, but generally these are applied at much below the t any level that would be toxic to a person. And also just whenever you're mixing chemicals, you wanna use gloves, you wanna use long sleeves. Uh, you, you know, you, that's, the area, that's the time when you wanna be the most careful of all is when you're putting these in the tank um, because you're, you're, you're handling um, more uh, concentrated forms than what you're putting on the plant. So, but, but these are all much sort of, if you're getting into the, the commercial side and you've got certain chemicals that are specifically for one disease, particularly certain insecticides, they can be a little bit more concerning in terms of that. But everything that we've recommended today, sulfur and spinosad are, are actually already uh, allowed in organic production. So they're super mm -hmm. soft chemicals in that regard. And captan is about as safe as you can get on the commercial chemical side as well. Okay, so organic only or captan, okay, no, captan is not allowed uh, in organic. It's not labeled for organic. And honestly, I wouldn't know what to recommend for you aside from captan in an organic situation. I would have to go back and look that up to be honest. 
Uh, most formulations of copper are organic. <clears throat> Would copper be as effective as CapCan? Copper can uh, work for bacterial angular leaf spot. It's the only mm -hmm. bacterial disease that we have. But generally what happens with copper is that it, and you may not see it, but it'll stunt the plant a little bit and reduce your yield. So generally what we've found is that copper or the bacteria are gonna reduce your yields about the same amount. <laughs> so basically growers, the only thing they can do is just try to prevent it by using clean plants to begin with. They really shy away from using copper and strawberries because particularly some varieties, and I would say sensation is particularly this way, is very sensitive to copper. If you apply too much, it'll just stunt the plant and shut it down. So I actually would basically recommend staying away from copper and strawberries. And, and for, for the fungal diseases like your anthracnose and botrytis, like I said, I would have to look up or ask someone else at UF who, who deals with organic, uh, or like our pathologist, what, what you would use. To be honest, I really doubt there's a good control for these, for these outside of the, the more conventional ones. Um, in organic systems, you're really gonna have to rely on good air movement so that, you, you know, basically, Moisture is not your friend on the, on the leaves and on the fruit. Basically, you want to have really good air movement and, and keep it as dry as you can. So some hanging system or some system where you space the plants out nicely, that is gonna, that's going to help you with these fungal diseases more than anything will, to be honest. Okay, can you put the chemicals on the plants to prevent the pest mold issues? or do you only add chemicals when they're already there? That's a great question. So say for thrips or mites or, um, or your mildew, I would say absolutely don't, don't apply anything until you actually see something happening there. For these other generalist fungi stuff that are, that are already, always attacking, I recommend basically a regular captan regimen for those of you who are not organic and can use captan. If, if, it's, if it's been wet, foggy, rainy in a period, I would recommend spraying it about every week. If, um, if it's not, if it's been drier and cooler, you can go two, three weeks in between sprays. But So I'd say for the fungi, you want to be a little more preventative because it's kind of one of those deals when, when they're already there, it's much harder to, <laughs> to control them. But for the insects and mite pests and for powdery mildew specifically, you can, you can see the symptoms and you can control them after they're already there. And so I would wait until you see those symptoms specifically or those signs of the disease or the pest itself before you do anything for uh, thrips, mites, or for the powder mildew disease. Do I recommend serenade for fungus? Okay. I'm gonna to have to look up Serenade. If I remember correctly, I think Serenade's one of those biological products. Yes, uh, Bacillus subtilis, I think. Yeah, so, okay. So basically, our pathologist has some, done some research with those, and I'm sure she's done Serenade as well as a number of others. Generally, those products are not nearly as effective as uh, the conventional standards. And they can be fairly expensive. So in general, I guess what I would say in general, and I don't have specific experience with Serenade, but generally these bacterial products, they can potentially help, but don't expect them to be able to clear up a heavy infestation of a disease and expect for them to be fairly expensive. So I think that you're just going to want to do your kind of own cost benefit, you know, analysis to determine whether it's really working for you or not. And I was actually correct. Um, Serenade does contain Bacillus subtilis, which is a bacteria. Good memory there, Bill. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, we have uh, another question in the chat. Uh, why do the plants put out so many tentacles or runners and nothing else happens? Great question. So 
basically strawberries have two main parts to their life cycle. They have the, the flowering part of the life cycle and then they have the let's multiply ourselves by runners part of the life cycle. And generally what happens is when you start to get long days and high temperatures, the plants will run or and not flower, okay? But when the days are getting shorter, as we're getting into the, the fall and the temperatures are going down, then the strawberries will start flowering and they will run or less. So generally, um, even if you plant at the right time in the fall, you're gonna get some runners pretty being produced in the fall as they're starting to produce flowers as well. You just wanna cut off those runners because you don't want plant production, you want fruit. Um, so, so, so basically, um, if you're getting only runners, it may be that your strawberry variety you're not planting is not adapted to Florida, it can't handle the heat. Um, or it could be that you're planting at a time of the year where um, uh, it, it's just very hot and you're getting a lot of runners. If you plant around October 15th, yes, you're gonna get a few runners after planting, cut those off. But as long as you're maintaining the plant pretty well into the fall, at some point in November, you're gonna start getting some flowering. And then the, as it gets cooler, the runnering will really reduce. So just cut off the runners that are there uh, and just wait for that flowering and just make sure that you're planting uh, in the fall as opposed to in the spring. Uh, let's see, when you say plants around October 15th, is that the plant transplant or the bare root? So whether you're using a plug that has the active root system or a bare root plant, either way, you're gonna wanna plant around October 15th. It's the same for all the different plant, plant uh, transplant types. And I see we got the question about the runners. Again, you know, just cut the runners uh, just with some scissors or pinch them off um, as they come. If you, uh, if, you, if you leave runners too long and let them get long and start producing daughter plants that are starting to root and that kind of thing, you're, you're, the energy is being used for this vegetative multiplication and so you're gonna get less flowers. So uh, if you let the runners grow too long, let them get too long, it's gonna reduce your flowering and so that's why I recommend as soon as you see runners, just clip them off. Hey, I see one pretty much last question, I guess. Can a fish fertilizer, a 511, be used in a vertical garden in Florida? Um, I know that fish emulsions are pretty common in organic you know, production. So I, I guess I would say yes, I'm sure that they can be used. I think the challenge is just to, to get enough fertility, you know. Um, you're, you're just going to want to keep in mind that um, a, a commercial grower generally applies fertilizer almost every day. Um, strawberries like to be fed pretty consistently. So if you're using a 511, especially something like that, that's going to have a little less nitrogen in it than your maybe typical conventional fertilizer, you're probably gonna to wanna to fertilize pretty often and be slightly more on the aggressive side to start. Um, and then just monitor your plants to see how you're doing. Just because those, those organic fertilizers, um, as a rule, just they tend to, to be a little bit lower in their concentration of nitrogen. The other thing that you can try is if you really do wanna go organically is you know the sensation variety is more vigorous. It's gonna be able to produce a plant a little bit um, more rapidly with uh, the same amount of nitrogen compared to the other varieties. So if you if you are committed to or organic formulations for for nitrogen and other nutrients, I would, in addition to your brilliance, try some sensation because you might find that you can grow the sensation a little easier. Okay, and one more in the chat here. How long can you keep uh, bare root plants in the refrigerator till planting? Uh, that's a great question. Generally, you want to keep them as, uh, as minimally in the refrigerator as possible because every day that they're in the refrigerator, they're, they're actually losing a little bit of carbon in the crown, some of that reserve stores that are gonna help that plant grow vigorously once it gets in the ground. 
generally you can keep them up to a week if it's a really good quality transplant. But generally I would say that beyond a week is really tough and ideally you want to plant um, as quickly as you can after receiving the plants. Uh, so we have one more question in the chat about getting uh, the availability of varieties like Brilliance and Sensation. You know, Bill, maybe I should put up that slide again. Okay. Um, and again, these slides are going to be available from Bill upon request. But what I did here was I put a slide in, in here about transplant sources and it basically if you can combine orders with other people and get an order of say 5,000 plants with, from your garden club or your local extension office or something like that, you can try one of these nurseries here in the middle of the slide. And they may be willing to ship plants that you can pick up somewhere in Plant City, for example. Other possible local sources would be Parksdale Farms, um, which is on uh, uh, 92 in Plant City, um, or um, the Florida Strawberry Growers Association might be able to find you some plants that are, say, left over from a grower that had a few extras. They sometimes have connections like that where you get to around the 15th and most growers are finishing up planting at that time in Plant City area. So it can be a really good time to get on the, get on the horn around October 15th to the FSGA and say, hey, are there any growers that have leftover plants for sale? And the FSGA may be able to say, yeah, Grimes has just said they have some leftover plants. If they're cooler, you can go and purchase some from them. So, be, be, so your, your ideal time for planting is October 15th, but as, I, but as I said, growers in Plant City, the commercial growers tend to push that a little earlier. So that can be a good time to find leftover plants through the FSGA. Okay. And have you ever seen appropriate varieties for Central Florida for sale at big box stores? No, they're, they're not available at big box stores. Generally what big box stores do is they, they get these old varieties um, that, you know, tend to be off patent. Um, and as a result, they're quite old, um, uh, you know, because they don't want to pay the cost of the royalties or something like that. And, and strawberries are one of those things where there's just not a lot of good knowledge about those among that, that sector, you know. So they'll choose an old variety that's usually an ever-bearing or day-neutral type variety that somebody could potentially get some fruit off no matter where they plant it in the U.S. Uh -huh. But as a result, those varieties are not going to be very particularly adapted to anywhere, you know. <laughs> and, and, and strawberry varieties are very specific to where they're adapted to. The varieties that are planted in Florida are actually very different than the varieties that are planted even in Southern California, even though you would think that they they would be very similar, uh, are very different to the mid-Atlantic varieties, are very different to the northern varieties. So strawberry varieties, you just have to keep in mind, are generally very specific to the area where they were developed. And as a result, the box stores, they don't go through the work of saying, well, these stores are going to carry these varieties. These No, they just send out the same variety all over the country. Yeah. And generally, that means you're getting a substandard quality of variety from a store like that. With the white variety, because we're hoping that it's going to be the, the first white one on the market in the U.S., and if the box stores start picking that up in two, three, four years, that one by, by chance is going to be a Florida bred variety and it's going to work for here. Uh, and should, should work in some areas, but um, that one, if you see it in a box store and you see it's, um, you know, the Florida whatever variety, it's usually going to have Florida in front of it you'll know, okay, that's a Florida variety. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't have Florida in front of it in the name, um, you know, you, you should not expect to see these varieties anywhere that a, a you know, Joe homeowner can, can buy them, you're not gonna find them. Yeah, I know you need to be very careful at your local big box store because what they have might do well in Florida, which is a totally different part of Florida than what you live in. Yeah. We see that with a lot of different plants there. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other questions here. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, just thanks everyone for their great questions. I realize in the questions that there's some things I should have covered in, <laughs> in my presentation, <laughs> but that's, that's for next time. Um, uh, you know, it was a pleasure and I hope that this information is, is, is helpful. 
uh, and uh, you know you can you can feel free to contact me directly in the future if you have a variety related question um, uh, but like I said please follow look at those four links that Bill put in the chat and that are in the presentation those four links together just have a wealth of information so hopefully many of your questions would be answered in those resources um, and then if not um, you know, obviously we have UF extension folks like myself and Bill who would be happy to help. And for anybody watching this after the fact, watching the recording, if you need any more information, any of those links, a copy of the slides, just send me an email, just reach out and contact us. We're, we're, we're still hard at work and very available here. That's right. <laughs> okay.